My name is Joanne Yao, and I'm the Senior Director of Marketing for Impedimed. Today's webinar is titled Surgeon Insights. Is now the time to start a program for early detection and intervention of breast cancer-related lymphedema? We have a wonderful panel of breast surgeons joining us today. Dr. Amir Gambarawala, breast surgeon, surgical oncologist and medical director of informatics at Advocate Aurora Health and assistant clinical professor of surgery at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Laura Lawson is a breast surgeon at the Nashville Breast Center in Tennessee and the medical director of Ascension St. Thomas Breast Cancer Program. And we have Dr. Stephanie Valente, breast surgeon and director of the Breast Surgical Breast Oncology Fellowship Program at the Cleveland Clinic, associate professor of surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine and Case Western Reserve University. So today's webinar will be a live panel discussion. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions via the Q&A icon on your screen at any time during today's discussion. We will answer as many questions as possible during the next hour, and we'll follow up on any questions that we're not able to address live. We are also happy to offer certificates of completion for your participation in this webinar upon request. To request a certificate, you may either respond to your registration confirmation email, email us at info at impedimed.com or contact your local impedimed representative. All of our webinars are available for replay approximately one week following the event. You may find them on our YouTube, on, uh, YouTube channel called Impedimed Oncology. And when you're there, please don't forget to subscribe. Uh, now I will go ahead and invite our panelists to join me on video. Hello. Hi, Dr. Gambarawala. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Valente. It looks like the only one we're missing is Dr. Lawson. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started and hopefully Dr. Lawson, oh, there you are. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, have you unmute as well, please. Thank you, excellent. So thank you everybody um, for joining. Uh, uh, let's go ahead and start with introductions. So Dr. Gambarawala, would you mind introducing yourself um, tell us a little bit about your current role and practice and any interesting focus areas. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm a Dr. Amir Gambarawal. I'm a breast surgeon at uh, Advocate Aurora Health and specifically Christ Medical Center in the south suburbs of Chicago. Uh, we are a group of three breast surgeons. I'm joined by um, a larger group of breast surgeons across our health system. Um, my current specialties within breast cancer uh, one of my main focuses is reducing the collateral damage of treatment. And part of that is utilizing the impedimed SOZO system and uh, axillary reverse mapping and lympha. So those are um, some things that I've been focusing on through my career. We started the program, uh, the AH system started it around uh, 2011, 2012. And my group started utilizing the SOZO system when it came out around 2018. Thank you, Dr. Gambarawala. Uh, Dr. Lawson, would you tell us a little bit about your current role and practice? Great, yes, I'm Laura Lawson. I'm a breast surgical oncologist at the National Breast Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, my partner's Pat Whitworth, who many of you may be familiar with. He's a, a leader in our field and has a special interest in lymphedema also. Um, I see 100% breast patients, all ages. I do my own ultrasound-guided core biopsies, um, stereotactic biopsies. I also work with the Vanderbilt University Fellowship Program and help train their fellows to do ultrasound in the office. Um, special interests, I kind of a, a boots on the ground. I really like to do programmatic projects. And I've been the medical director of the Breast Cancer Program for Ascension for over a decade now and really helped start develop that program. Um, we're now one of the largest programs in the Southeast. Um, and as part of that, I helped develop our 
lymphedema program, our survivorship care program, our nurse navigation program, pretty much every program we have, I've been a part of that. And so I look forward to being able to talk to you all later um, during this presentation about really how to start a program from wh wherever you are, how to get that organized and one surgeon and one lymphedema therapist is really all you need and how to get that up and going. And then contrasting that with now um, in our private practice office, um, I have a lymphedema therapist whose office is right across the hallway from mine. So two very different systems with a private practice versus a large hospital system, but hope to be able to speak to both and help everyone gain maybe a little bit of insight and how to work within both of those systems. Thank you, Dr. Lawson. Wonderful. Dr. Valente, would you mind introducing yourself and your current uh, role in practice? Sure, good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I am a breast surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, where I teach the fellowship. Um, and so really kind of how I got started in this is um, advanced surgical uh, management of lymphedema. So um, I think it's really important, you know, as we treat patients uh, for breast cancer, kind of looking forward and treating, you know, the effects of um, our operation on these patients. And, you know, we all know that a patient fears lymphedema after cancer recurrence. And so um, this is a huge problem. And so as um, I started working with my plastic surgery colleagues um, on trying to figure out a surgical way to manage these patients, um, it became natural that we said, if we're going to do these procedures, we need to monitor our outcomes. And so um, we started to look at the best way um, to look at these outcomes. Um, and so we, you know, kind of collaborated, looked around and um, really believed in bioimpedance spectroscopy. Um, and Petamed um, has a lot of data surrounding it. Um, and so we've um, been active participants um, in using the devices. And so I'm interested in kind of sharing um, how we do things at the Cleveland Clinic tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for your introductions. And I hope all of you attending can see what an impressive group we have here. So please don't hesitate to chime in and ask questions. We wanna hear from you and answer as many as we can. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I think where we wanted to start is many of you touched on um, the fact that such dramatic improvements in detection and treatment of breast cancer has led to dramatically improved survivorship. Um, and as a result, survivorship has become a critical part of care as all of you are involved. And after successful treatment, lymphedema is a very important concern. So um, what I wanted to start off with is when we talk about, right, this, this title is, should we start a program for early detection and intervention of breast cancer-related lymphedema? So when we talk about early detection and intervention, what does that mean? What does that mean to you and why is it important? And Dr. Lawson, I'll ask you to kick us off here. Sure, I'd be happy to. So really, I think our, our goal with all of this is to prevent chronic lymphedema. We've done, we've come such a long way in being able to treat and to cure breast cancer, but we don't want to leave women for the remaining decades of their life with this giant sore arm wrapped in bandages. I mean, it really, that's a horrible thing. You know, we, we do so much good for people and they have almost forgotten their cancer, but then they have this daily reminder by this huge arm. And so now we have the tools that we can actually, um, we can measure it, we can treat it, we have surgical procedures that we can do to really intervene and prevent it. And so I think that's really now where we're, we're moving towards and really kind of how we do that. And so I wanted to go ahead and just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page with what we're talking about. So the differences between subclinical lymphedema and chronic lymphedema, just briefly go over some of those things. So the stage zero lymphedema, I'm sure everyone has seen the picture of the woman with the, the four different arms. We've all seen that picture, you know, where it starts a normal arm on one side and then the huge swollen arm on the far end. And so we wanna keep all of our patients on the normal arm. Um, and so that subclinical lymphedema, we can, actually detect that now with our LDEX, with our bioimpedance. And that is even before the woman notices that there's anything really going on. You know, it might feel a little bit vaguely heavy, uh, but not any visible swelling. And we can detect that and then we can do something about it. Um, and so that's what we're talking about with the stage one 
lymphedema, which is really where we want to catch things. Um, the I'm sorry, the stage zero. Stage one, that degree of swelling might come and go. The patient's a little bit more aware of it. Um, when they elevate their arm, it'll get a little bit better for them. Um, and that is at where we were previously kind of limited, we had the systems in place, we could recognize lymphedema at that point, but we're getting real close then to stage two lymphedema, which is what we consider to be chronic lymphedema. And so that one is, there's visible swelling, um, a woman has a lot more discomfort and problems with that. Um, and we will really wanna to try to avoid then the stage three, which is when that extracellular fluid gets replaced with fat and fibrotic tissue. Um, and that's really when our treatments, we can't really do very much. And really they're just more in a chronic maintenance stage. So we're really trying to all of this design to catch things early when we can prevent them. Um, Thank you, Dr. Lawson. And Dr. Uh, Valente or Dr. Gombrowala, um, when you think about these stages of lymphedema, how does treatment differ? Um, if you're talking about, you know, so you detect it early, you find it at stage zero or stage one, like Dr. Lawson suggested, what do you do? So um, basically the benefits of de early detection is you'll generally refer them to uh, a physical therapist or your occupational therapist and specifically a lymphedema specialist. We'll usually see them for about a month, give them exercises, do massage therapy, and intervene with a usually a temporary compressive sleeve um, versus when it's caught in later stages, these therapies are often chronic and need to be repeated. Mm -hmm. And what does chronic therapy look like, Dr. Valente? So chronic therapy, uh, these patients um, either wear a sleeve um, most, most every day of the week um, maybe they wrap themselves or they have to have family members wrap themselves. They have to wear um, a glove or a gauntlet. Um, imagine uh, trying to wash your hands um, even during COVID uh, with a glove on all the time. Um, a lot of times they're you know, not able to wear the right fitting clothing because they need a bigger arm sleeve. Um, but a lot of times these women are going to therapy a couple times a week, um, which you know they kind of have to manage between jobs and stuff like that. So um, you know, kind of my take on this is that screening for lymphedema is just like getting a mammogram. I mean, we're screening for our risk of cancer. And so we know that in women who undergo lymph node surgery, um, there's a risk, um, whether it's lower in sentinel node or higher in axillary lymph node dissection, that these women could get lymphedema. And so screening, um, you know, with bioimpedance is offering women the opportunity to, if they get lymphedema, just like if they get breast cancer, that it would be caught early, just like mammogram, where they have options. Um, if it's caught later, then, you know, and, and women don't really know what to look for sometimes, that if it's caught later, then, you know, they are wearing sleeves and they say, gosh, I wish this could have been caught earlier. Okay, thank you. Now, what is a optimal program uh, look like or a protocol? to make sure that you are detecting it and, and treating early? So what we do at the Cleveland Clinic is, um, so any patient that comes in with a new cancer diagnosis, I mean, sometimes they're gonna go get new adjuvant chemo, sometimes they're gonna go to surgery first. Um, we educate them. A pediment has a great little booklet that, they, that we give patients in their new cancer folder. And we do get a baseline on every patient that comes in the door with a diagnosis of cancer. Um, so that's their baseline, whether they get taxane chemotherapy or whether they get a sentinel node. Um, and our follow-up of these patients um, is really based on their risk, but everybody has a baseline so that if they develop lymphedema, we've got something to compare it to. Excellent. So then, um... You detect them. How do you follow them up after surgery? Um, you know, are you seeing them uh, regularly? What type of visits do you see them on? What is what is your goal with regard to being able to catch the lymphedema after their their cancer treatment? Right. So it's based on risk. Um, so a lot of times when we see patients post op, that's a little too soon, but. Um, traditionally, it's three to six months after, and then just kind of asking, do you have any symptoms of lymphedema? Um, for sentinel node, uh, we'll usually do a six-month post-op baseline. Um, for axillary lymph node dissection, we follow these patients closely. Um, 
they all do see um, in our program what we call breast rehab, uh, where they do see a therapist um, and follow with measurements um, pretty regularly. So every six months for the first five years is what we use um, a little bit closely in the first three years where we can do every three to four months as well. Okay. Now, Dr. Lawson, I mean, one of the questions that we get a lot is um, whether all patients should be getting baseline and should be getting tested or whether you only test patients that are at very high risk for lymphedema. And specifically, the question we get a lot is, do you think that patients who undergo sentinel node biopsy should get um, baseline and follow-up LDEX testing, or can you exclude those patients because their risk is so low? Well, I don't, um, I don't think we can really safely exclude anyone. I mean, we'd like to, but um, in reality, I think all patients need to be tested. And sometimes you don't know what the future is going to hold. So you might think, oh, we're only going to be doing a sentinel node, but then that might change and they might be end up having an axillary dissection or they might end up having radiation. So we don't, since we don't know exactly what each patient's um, course is going to be, and there are also some other factors. I mean, certainly we think about um, an axillary dissection, chemotherapy, the radiation. There are different ways that the radiation can be delivered. Um, there's some individual patient factors. Um, what other medical problems do they have? We're finding that obesity plays into this. So um, I really think that probably the most straightforward approach would be if you're going to have anything done to your axilla, you need to have testing beforehand. Um, it is sometimes logistically a little easier. I think most of us from a surgery standpoint, you know, if they're going to be having surgery first, we've gotten that down pretty well of, okay, you know, everyone who's going to be having surgery, make sure we get their testing done. But I know that sometimes if they go off and have neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that's something that I think at a lot of programs, people just need to be aware of that, okay, at some point, they're going to be having some axillary surgery. We need to make sure we have a system in place to also capture those folks. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Valente or Dr. Gomberwala. anything to add to that? Yeah, so, um, you know, to the topic of today's discussion, like, is now a good time to start this program? Um, with the uh, uh, advent of the Sozo machine compared to what LDEX used to be, so just for a little bit of historical knowledge, LDEX used to be this uh, EKG style stickers that you would have to place on the patient that wasn't very seamless. And now, and why we waited a little bit, as in my personal institution, to get the Sozo machine is because it's so easily uh, implementable throughout uh, a facility. So anyone can do it. Um, and the more you utilize it, the easier it becomes for your staff. So if, similarly to Dr. Lawson, we will treat uh, and evaluate all of our patients undergoing any central lymph node uh, procedure or any axillary procedure, mostly because it's, you whether it's one to 5% for sentinel nodes, or you know, 15 to 20, or maybe even 30 to 50 percent on action lymph node dissections and radiation. You just never know which patient it's going to be, and this can give you at least some direction on who's going to be high risk or not. And it can be. There's a lot of talk, and um, even Impedimeta utilizes this, is that it can be a new vital sign. And in our practice, it's kind of looked at and taken in, just like we take their blood pressure. They're going to stand on this machine for 30 seconds, and we're going to get this breast cancer vital sign for them. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Valente, you talked about getting a baseline on all of your patients as well. Um, do you do that simply post or pre-surgery or do you try and get those before neoadjuvant chemotherapy begins as well? So we actually, again, a lot of it's just workflow. So initially we were, we, you know, we're trying to be judicious with it and said, okay, anybody who gets an axillary lymph node dissection and then, you know, they get a workup and then they're like, oh, we forgot, you know, so then it just kind of became exactly what Dr. Lawson said. It's just easier to get it on everybody because then if somebody has symptoms later, you're like, did I get it? Did I not get it? Um, so, you know, when the patients walk in, there's a scale, they stand on the scale. There's the Sozo machine, they stand on the Sozo. Um, and in our electronic medical record, it's charted just like that. So you can actually see um, just next to like the blood pressure um, exactly where they are. So you're not kind of fidgeting with that. So we've kind of just built it in. So it's really easy for us to manage and look at it. Thank you. I think that's 
pretty uh, consistent across the board that you're all trying to just get the testing on everybody up front with SOZO, it's easy, um, which is great. Now, uh, Dr. Gambarwala, um, was wondering if you could take the next question here, which, you know, is there any evidence? I mean, you, you started to allude to it, but would you just talk a little bit about what evidence supports actually even doing this type of protocol? Right, right. So I guess uh, the, without getting into making this into like a didactic lecture and going through multiple different papers, this probably first starts with uh, some and probably ends with the, the PREVENT trial, to be honest. So uh, most of the people on this call are probably familiar with um, bioimpedance spectroscopy and early detection, whether it be tape measure, whether it be bioimpedance spectroscopy, so subclinical lymphedema. In general, we know that early detection leads to better outcomes and pretty much across different um, disease states. So if we just focus on lymphedema, now is a great time to bring this evidence up to your you know, hospital administration or colleagues, private practice managers, because we, at the minimum in 2019, have the interim analysis for the PREVENT trial, which was, which was a randomized control trial between um, tape measuring versus bioimpedance spectroscopy. And the one year, uh, an interim analysis demonstrated quite a significant reduction in both the amount of patients who were triggered into receiving that one month of therapy that we talked about earlier, as well as the progression of lymphedema. And to give some rough numbers, it's something along the lines of like 28 to like 15% versus on the trigger side. And then for the progression side, about a 14% versus 7%, um, again, in the interim one year analysis. And we're looking forward to the publication of the uh, final prevent trial once that comes out. And secondly, another piece of evidence that most of us use as like kind of gold standards of evidence is a meta-analysis. And recently in 2020, um, Dr. Shah published a wonderful meta-analysis for about 50 studies, which included about 67,000 women across the board, all pretty much demonstrating the same thing that bioimpedance spectroscopy compared to all other methods of um, uh, lymphedema detection uh, found a lower long-term lymphedema rate um, overall. So, and those rates roughly you know, 7% to down to 2% in the meta-analysis. So um, without going into further detail about like specifics of different papers, I think that because you have both a meta-analysis as well as a potential, and by the time you'll probably, you know, approach your hospital administration or practice providers, the, I'm hopeful that the uh, prevent, long-term prevent trial uh, information will, will be out there. Uh, yeah. I didn't use the word long term, but what I meant, so, uh, in addition to long term stuff, you know, anecdotally, we've been utilizing it in the ADH system for about uh, eight, eight to nine years. And from that long term data, you know, we've had, it's not just the first couple of years, long term, it does uh, carry over. Okay, thank you. And, you know, do any of you, uh, many of you have been using these technologies for a while. One of the questions we get a lot is, you know, what's the longevity of this? If you're following patients through three years and treating them, and I mean, are you seeing that we're actually able to resolve the lymphedema and that that is a durable outcome? Um, what's your experience there? So, uh, you know, my colleague, uh, Dr. Heidi Memel, has been utilizing it at her hospital, Lutheran General, and the advocate system um, since around 2011, 2012. And uh, her lymphedema rate is roughly around two to three percent over the course of these years. Um, so there's, we're in the process of evaluating this and publishing one of our more long-term series on, on this. So there's, while it's, there's no robust data just yet across, like no multi-centered trial, but since the SOZO machine has come out, there has been a large number of uh, institutions adopting this technology because it's no longer cumbersome. It's no longer something you have to train for. And we'll get to, potentially we'll get to cost later down the road, but it's not, it's something that's like, cost effective. So it's kind of like a win across the board. So I'm hopeful to see more long-term data, but right now it's mostly anecdotal small series. Thank you. Um, Dr. Valente or Dr. Lawson, anything to add to that? I mean, I think if you look at it, you know the risk, you know, 75% of women who develop lymphedema will do so in the first three years. 
So, you know, we kind of look at it as, you know, yeah, there is that 25%, but you have to maximize screening in the population that's at the highest risk. Um, you know, so we do kind of target those first three years um, and then and then use it. And I think patients are, are excited to use it to see actually how well they're doing in treatment, um, to see if treatment's working, you know, or if it is progressing through treatment, you know, it helps us figure out how to change treatment for these women. Um, but at least, you know, three years for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, we've, thank you for going through that. And um, we started to talk about your program specifically, and I'm happy to see we're getting a lot of questions through Q&A following up on some of our protocol discussions. So let's talk about your, your programs that you have in place today. Um, Dr. Valente, I'd like to start with you. Any color you can add? You started to outline your program a little bit, but any more color that you can add about um, what techniques or technologies you chose, you evaluated um, before, before deciding to use SOZO with LDEX for early detection? What other specialties are involved? Um, you mind talking a little bit about that? Sure. So we're a large academic center. Uh, we do kind of span Northeast Ohio with a lot of different um, hospitals um, within our system. So the surgeons go to different places. Um, as we started looking at our operative, you know, what are we doing um, operatively uh, wise? We teamed up with plastic surgery, uh, number one, and, um, and then radiation oncology, number two, and then brought in our occupational therapist and our physical therapist. So we actually created what we call lymphedema program. Um, and part of that program, we have monthly meetings and we, we learn a lot from each other. Um, I think that's, you know, kind of like we're in our bubble. And so we kind of learn um, who's gonna actually test. So we decided, okay, I see the cancer patient first, all screenings are going to come through me, um, and and or not me, but just the breast surgeon. And then um, you know if they're getting followed up, if they've had a lymphovenous bypass, um, then they're getting followed with plastics, you know. And then even bringing rehab in, and and um, some of our rehab centers don't have SOZO, so SOZO's at our hospitals and our ambulatory surgery centers. And so so the therapists were saying, okay, tell us how do we use that information. Um, and, you know, and they do like tape measurements. So they, we do let them do that part. So that helps them feel um, like they're doing their part. So patients actually get both. If they go for treatment, they get their circumferential arm measurements from therapy. And then when they come to see us, but um, any patient who's had tested at any point can stop by uh, one of the hospitals to get tested. Um, again, just to kind of see where they're at. Um, and any of the providers, even our survivorship providers, our medical breast team, um, because not all the surgeons see their patients for three or five years, um, are on board and they screen patients as well. So we've, over time, it didn't happen overnight at all, um, but we've developed this program, kind of got buy-in and really are learning from each other on kind of best practices and kind of, you know, our own um, flow sheet on when we send um, you know, to therapy and when patients are progressing, when do they send to plastic surgery for lymphovenous bypass or lymph node transfer? Um, so we're learning from each other, but it, but it is a big program, but it did start small and um, that's kind of what we're going with right now. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Gombrowala, now your practice setting is slightly different. Um, you know, how do you run the program? What's its current state and how might it be different um, you know, an advocate of oral health as compared to a large university system like Cleveland Clinic? So um, one of the, so it started in uh, with uh, Dr. Heidi Memel was the kind of medical director, but it, she, and currently still has the uh, system housed in her physical therapy, or like her group's physical therapy office. So it's a, in, you know, separate physical therapy. And her practice pattern was such that she would refer all of the patients who were getting axillary surgery over to physical therapy. So we looked at that as an option and we said, you know, given our current state, we're gonna be missing a lot of patients. Um, patients don't wanna to go to another office. They're already tired enough that they have to see three different doctors to treat their breast cancer. Um, as afraid of lymphedema as they are, we wanna try and make it as convenient as, po as possible. In our practice setting, the breast surgeon kind of leads the uh, cancer treatment and, 
and, and in probably most institutions and from a private practice standpoint, I bet that that's the case. Um, if you're a specialty breast surgeon, you're probably taking a leadership role in their care. So uh, when I, around 2018, um, when we introduced this concept here, I was a big proponent to put it in our surgeon's offices. That's the people who are gonna be utilized most. Uh, we can be the gatekeepers, we're gonna see them. And because of all of our interests in this reduction of collateral damage, we're all on board. So we have it, and we have three different uh, offices, uh, outpatient offices where we see our patients. Um, and our cancer center is connected to these offices, it, but patients would generally, if they got seen in the cancer center, like a new diagnosis, they would just walk over to our follow-up offices and then uh, get that test done. Um, so it's, it is housed in that an MA then does come and uh, walk them through just like a vital sign. And similar to, I think Dr. Vonte uh, was mentioning, our patients are free to come in and utilize this as, as like their, you know, if they want to ever check their blood pressure, they could come to our office. I mean, you know, they don't ever want to do that, but if they ever wanted to come in and check their version of it, check their LDEX, they say, hey, maybe I feel funny or something. They'll just walk in. They have a great relationship with our staff. They don't need an appointment. And, they, and then it's a new data point that we can collect. Now, people didn't take a lot of advantage of it because, again, they have a lot of office visits already. So our typical program would be pre-op, um, post-op, we would do it uh, just to get data to show that it did not falsely elevate post-op. You didn't get like this huge number of false triggers. Um, so that's been our experience. And then we would do it six months, 12 months, and then every six months for the first two and a half to three years, and then annually after that. Thank you. Hey, we got an interesting question for you over Q&A. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of any other major hospital systems in the Chicagoland area? with these types of programs? <laughs> um, so I, I believe that Northwestern um, has this and I don't know, I know that they have a couple of Sozo machines. Um, I haven't been in direct contact with them recently, but I know that they attended one of our lymphedema prevention courses and ours, I mean the American Society, uh, the ASBS had a uh, um, prevention program that you know we went over axial reverse mapping and lympha. So we did, I get, did get a chance to talk to one, one of the breast surgeons there. So Chicago, um, in Chicago Northwestern does, I believe have these. I hope, I, I want to think we were one of the few, but I don't know any large uh, system that has this program and definitely not the longevity uh, because I know that Dr. Heidi Memel has been using it for a long time and we have a relatively robust uh, program um, within our group, so. Absolutely, and you know, I think the patient, I think it's probably a patient who asked that question and um, for any patients that are on this webinar, I do want to make you aware of a resource. If you visit our website, impedimed.com, you'll see a find a provider um, page. You can go there and enter your zip code and you can find LDEX providers near you. Um, and if you have any issues with that, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'll help you get in touch with an appropriate provider. And that service is available for anyone in the US. If you're not in the US, we'll get in touch with us and we'll get you in touch with a local contact in your country. So thank you for that question. Um, Dr. Lawson, would you mind uh, talking a little bit about your program? And, you know, we did get a question about um, where SOZO is kept and, and who's responsible for performing the test. And many of you talked about already, you keep it next to the scale. Um, mostly you have MAs uh, perform the tests, but would you mind talking a little bit about some of your program implementation and and how you've been able to make it successful in your practice. Sure, I'd be happy to. So initially back in 2000, probably 14 or 15, when we were doing the, um, the LDEX testing was back with the, the, the lead, like the EKG leads, um, I was curious as to what was currently happening for our patients because we had active lymphedema therapists. And so I went with them and we went over to the main hospital physical therapy department. And so we walked by all the men who were in rehab for their knees and their hips and our lymphedema therapist was sort of in a room in the back. And I thought, no, 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 this is not what we want here. Um, and so we actually got buy-in from administration um, because we really were able to present it as, and this was before survivorship care was even a thing, but really that this is, we want to provide a full service for our patients. And um, we know that what we're doing for their treatment is causing lymphedema. So we need to help. 
Um, and we had a lot of buy-in, everyone was really supportive. And so what we did to start with, um, literally one lymphedema therapist worked with my patients and we looked at what days I was in clinic, what days I would see the most patients. Um, we had an extra room in our clinic. And so she started to see patients there. And then we thought, well, how are we gonna capture patients? So we did a flow sheet, we brought in our nurse navigators. And so then when the patient was scheduled for surgery, that triggered a referral for the nurse navigator and the physical therapist or the lymphedema therapist. And then when the patient came in for their pre-op testing, they would meet with the lymphedema therapist, have their baseline measurements. They do their pre-op testing, get their garments, meet with anesthesia. You know, we have a lot of patients that come from a couple hours away. Tennessee is a really long state and we see people coming in from both directions, from north, from south. So we really wanted to get a lot done on that one visit. Um, and so then once we got the flow down to my patients, then we said, okay, there are two other surgeons in my office. Let's branch out and have them start using it. And then we thought, okay, well, we also have other surgeons that are on this campus. All right, let's bring them in. And it kind of grew and it grew. And so now it's, you know, different hospitals. We've been able to replicate, okay, what works at, we kind of have one main hospital where most of the breast surgery happens. So we kind of, that's sort of our, um, our incubator till we get things set up and going and then we branch it out and have our other hospitals um, be able to implement those same programs. And so now when the patient's getting ready for pre-op, then they meet with the lymphedema therapist um, and have those measurements made. And that's a little bit, that's in our, our, our program um, that is a lot of different private practice surgeons, employed surgeons coming in from a lot of different locations. In my current private practice um, at the National Breast Center, or as I mentioned before, our lymphedema therapist is actually across the hallway. And so that is a, a little bit easier, but I realize not everyone's going to have that um, to be able to do that. And so we actually move the Sozo machine. It's right next to the scale. And so they come in and it's just a, an extra vital sign that they get. And then Andrea works with... Um, patients and we really use the Sozo machine to identify patients and then we have a lot of outstanding therapists that are out in the community so then we refer patients out to you know because most of them aren't going to be able to drive the two hours back here to have their therapy so we've really worked hard to make sure all the surrounding communities that have their lymphedema therapist are on board with kind of what we're doing and they can do whatever measurements they need. But once we've identified patients, then they go out to the other facilities and then come back and have their checks to see, okay, you know, your LDEC score was up. What is it now? Has your treatment been successful? And then they come back in. So kind of two different types of programs um, that we have that are, are both going in and both work equally well. I think really the important thing is you just have to you need a, a, a lymphedema therapist who's really active and engaged and willing to work with the surgeons, but probably most importantly, a, a champion of the program. And usually that's going to be your breast surgeon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Lawson. So really appreciate getting a view of all of your programs. And, you know, I'm going to kind of go back to some of our earlier discussions about workflow because we're getting a lot of questions here and we have some about the technology. We have some about workflow. We have some about the relationship between surgeons and therapists, and then we have some about billing. And so why don't we tackle kind of each of those in sequence? So um, one of the first questions is around, um, you know, around bioimpedance itself and LDEX itself. And one of the questions is, does uh, bioimpedance pick up axillary cording and web syndrome? Um, and at what stage do you classify axillary web syndrome. So I'll take the technical question, bioimpedance picks up fluid. So what we're looking at with LDEX is a measure of the fluid in a patient's arm that's at risk for lymphedema and comparing it to another arm or limb that's not at risk for lymphedema. And in that way, we do get the LDEX score, which is an index um, and has been shown to be very 80% sensitive and 90% specific at detecting subclinical lymphedema at that 6.5 change from baseline. So that's how LDEX works. Um, any con comments from any of you on at what stage does the, the web syndrome develop? 
I think it's a good question. Um, I don't know if there's an association between the development of axillary web syndrome and subsequent lymphedema. Um, I can tell you that if somebody does have a web, we do send them to therapy and usually massage over time, a couple of weeks will actually fix that. But I don't know if those patients are at any increased higher risk for developing lymphedema. Uh, we do not give them a sleeve because they have a web, um, but I'd be interested in seeing what Dr. Gambarawala and Dr. Lawson think. Mm. I don't think that's something that we see real often. I mean, certainly we'll see the, the cording um, that usually happens pretty soon after surgery. Um, and I, anecdotally, I don't see a big relationship with that and the development of lymphedema. The thing we see a lot is just a seroma. Um, and, you know, we'll have women that have chronic seromas that have to be drained a lot. But interestingly, that seems to be more of a a related a post-op thing and not so much a thing that leads to the chronic lymphedema but I think you need well-trained lymphedema therapists to deal with all of those aspects of the care um, to do the directed massage whatever it's going to take and just really to reassure the patients that okay you know we'll keep following you hopefully this will get better but um, if it doesn't we'll keep doing our measurements because we're oftentimes watching for a couple different things at the same time. And to uh, kind of give my two cents, kind of, uh, I would agree with the, both Dr. Valente and Dr. Lawson that um, I, basically to answer the question more directly, I don't think uh, cording slash axillary web syndrome falls under those stages of lymphedema, so it wouldn't be categorized as that. Um, in regards to cording, I actually think it's a very uh, interesting concept. I actually have talked to my physical therapist, talked to a number of different people. We actually don't know what exactly that cord is. We've all felt it. We've all gone there. We feel it. We're like, what is that? Is it a vein? Is it something? We don't have a great answer to that. Um, so in that sense, what well, fortunately, because cording, I think is quite a bit more common than, um, you know, lymphedema for, especially particularly after a central lymph node biopsy, uh, it is hopefully self-resolving. It, it does, uh, you know, doesn't create long-term uh, effects. And uh, in my experience, those patients who do have cording will not have a increase in their LDEX score. Thank you, thank you. And um, another question about LDEX score, um, does chemotherapy affect it? Have you guys experienced chemotherapy impacting the LDEX score? So we do know, you know, historically that taxane-based chemotherapy um, can increase lymphedema. Um, we actually at the Cleveland Clinic are, are trying to look at that because we do send our patients, um, all cancer patients before they get treatment um, to see, you know, is there a correlation in their pre-op? Um, because when we see them, then I try and get them on the Sozo machine after chemotherapy before they go to surgery. Um, so we are actually trying to look at that. Um, I don't know how cl clean the data is going to be if we're going to be able to to get some good results from that. But that's a great question. And, and we're trying to look at that ourselves right now. Thank you. Yeah, and, and also, you know, in the PREVENT trial, um, you know, our typical protocol for follow-up that the company advises is based on the LDEX clinical practice guidelines, which were published in 2016. And that's um, LDEX score every three, every three months for the first three years following surgery. And if you look at the PREVENT trial protocol that Dr. Gumbarwala referenced, um, they did not test at the nine month visit. And that was simply because of concerns about interaction of taxane based chemotherapy that those patients would be undergoing. And they didn't want that to create false triggers in the trial in either the LDEX arm or the tape measure arm. So there definitely can be some effect there. And, um, you know, it's something for anyone interpreting LDEX to consider is what's going on with that patient. And Dr. Valente, it's great to hear that we're gonna see more research on that coming out of your program. Okay, so we are getting a lot of questions um, about the interaction between surgeons and therapists. And, um, you know, a couple of you talked about how, well, all of you talked about you're doing LDEX in your practice. You're also referring out to therapists. So the question is, is how important is it for you to have the therapists that you work with have SOZO and be taking LDEX scores? And then how do you share information with them? Is there a back and forth flow that, ha that takes place? Yeah, I can uh, comment on that. So I actually have 
in preparation for this, have talked with our lymphedema therapist to get a little bit more information. And that was one of my questions. I mean, in an ideal world, every physical therapist or every physical therapy department, every lymphedema therapist would have a sozo. Um, that would be amazing. In reality, we're not there yet. Um, and so I think you, we really need buy-in and help. It, this is a takes a village effort. And so if there's sort of a central hub, which most surgery practices, the surgeon is kind of the one that makes all the referrals out to everyone, um, sort of the same thing with the lymphedema program, the, the um, sort of the, the main therapist is associated somehow with the breast surgeon. And then if the SOZO measurements are done and we see those changes in the LDEC scores, um, you know, ideally everyone would be able to come back and have their treatment with our person in our office, but that's not really reality. I mean, so you're going to have to utilize whatever everyone else is bringing to the table and working, you know, with, with the therapist that, you know, is two hours away and then having, then when they're coming back in for their treatment, then we can say, oh, okay, you know, you're here for your follow-up visit. Let's do your measurements again, according to the protocol. And then we can see, oh, have you, has that therapy been successful or not? And then some follow-up, but you probably need sort of a, a driver of the ship from the surgery standpoint, as well as the lymphedema standpoint. And just to Thank kind you. of follow, follow up on that, um, you know, I can give our example because we have two different hospitals that are really utilizing this. One in, that's in our north, northern Chicago area with Dr. Memel, that's housed in our physical therapy department. Ours is uh, offered in our offices and we were both seeing benefits of each. So right now, Dr. Memel is trying to get one in her office and we're trying to get one in our physical therapist's office because, uh, but what the common feature of all of these is, and it's really going to be a, a surgeon who champion or some type of champion of this from the medical side, from a physician side and a lymphedema therapist. Those two are key to the success of this, where it's housed, where it's easier. Dr. Memo has a successful program in her group. I have a successful program within ours, so it can be housed either way. Billing is part of that conversation. Um, they have a little bit of an easier time billing. We have a little bit of a more difficult time billing, which is, you know, we can maybe get to that as a separate discussion but uh, there are pros and cons to each, but as long as one of the groups has it, uh, then you can see progression. And you're hopefully having that back and forth communication with your referring provider if you are on both ends, from the physical therapy side, you're talking with your surgeon who's referring you. And as a surgeon, you're talking with your lymphedema therapist to make sure that you know, this is being followed uh, accurately and um, you know, objectively with uh, bioimpedance spectroscopy, hopefully. Thank you. And Dr. Valente. Okay. So here's a question we've had. We got this before the webinar. We've got it during the webinar. For our therapy audience that relies on getting referrals from surgeons, some of them are struggling to get surgeons to refer the patients to them to be involved in this type of program. What barriers might exist to surgeons being willing to do the referral? And then what advice can you give them on how to overcome those barriers and convince the surgeons to participate in this program? You know, I think you don't know what you don't know. Um, so I, I you know, um, sometimes for surgery, we'll do surgery and we say, gosh, we have a low rate of lymphedema. Maybe we only follow our patients for six months or that, you know, that patient goes and gets treated and we have no idea and they don't want to tell us that they're having issues. So when they come see us, you know, maybe they don't wear their sleeve when they come or, you know, issues like that. So um, it, this whole program, it's about creating teams and, you know, what I do in the OR um, and how I manage the axilla is completely different on how these therapists approach patients what they teach patients. And so I think, you know, it's really collaboration. I'm like, am I telling patients the same thing that the therapists are telling the patients? And are we on the same page? And what can we learn from each other? And so I think it's a really good opportunity um, to create teams and just say, hey, tell me what you're doing. Um, tell me when you want to refer patients. This is what I'm telling patients. This is what I'm offering patients. Because sometimes as a surgeon, we'll send somebody to therapy and we have no idea because they're not you know, connected to our electronic medical record what actually happened during that uh, session. 
So um, again, I think communication is key. So if you just say, hey, this is what I'm doing for patients. And, and same thing, you know, when we're doing the, the lymphovenous bypass, the axillary reverse mapping, our therapists are, are telling us like, what restrictions do you want us to follow? Um, this is kind of our protocol. And so we've gone back and forth, but I think it's, it's really a, um, a collaborative effort of continued education, open communication. Um, and it can start with, it doesn't have to start with the surgeon. It can definitely start with the therapist reaching out and saying, hey, I'm noticing this. I think this is important. Um, tell me about how you're doing this. And that's an open communication. Thank you, Dr. Lawson, Dr. Gombrowal, anything to add to that? I'm hearing, I'm hearing communication is very important and, you know, both proactively, hey, this is what I'm doing, and then also following up on patients. Um, can you talk about that a little bit, Dr. Lawson? Well, I was thinking, too, that um, I, I would hope that the, it would be less of an issue going forward to get surgeons to realize they need to be doing this because it's pretty clear. I mean, the NCCN guidelines, it states recommend baseline and periodic measurements. Um, you know, our program went through our NAPBC reaccreditation and another hospital that I um, treat patients at recently did theirs. And that's, it's one of the standards in the NAPBC that you have to have a lymphedema program. Um, and so I would hope that as the majority of people, you know, have some of these programs and some follow some of these guidelines that it should be an easier sell from the lymphedema therapist standpoint of we're supposed to be doing this anyway. Um, so hopefully over time, then that word will percolate out that, okay, yes, this is a requirement. This is a, this is a no brainer. Yes, we have to do this period. Let's work together and get it started. Thank you. From a uh, practical standpoint, you know, we deal with a lot of different um, uh, physical therapy departments. One thing that's made it easier for us is kind of a standardized form of referral so that we can just sign it and send the patient off uh, should they have any sort of diagnosis. So if I was a physical therapist starting a practice or trying to engage a surgeon or a surgeon's office, I would approach that surgeon's office and say, hey, here's our referral, you know, like here's our referral sheet. <laughs> and all they have to do, if they find a patient who needs this treatment, just sign right here and send their send them over, and we'll be happy to take care of them. So trying to do that, make so it the easy. therapy office is providing the referral sheet to you. Uh, that is an so I'm just saying if I were a physical therapist in yeah. my or in like the Chicagoland area, and I saw that hey, there's a busy breast surgeon, uh, how can I engage them? I would try and set up a meeting, um, introduce myself, and then have a, a pre-written um, referral uh, or an order or something like that. And then, you know, that's how, that's how medicine's practice at the moment. You just kind of sign a sheet that has your, you know, as a referring provider and you send it over. So make it easy on them from that end. Uh, if, and then the communicate, they'll see like you'll, um, th you'll get, I mean, the th therapists are like the unspoken heroes of all of this. They're, you know, I know that there's probably not one on this panel, but there absolutely should be. I saw one of the Questionnaires by one of our one a uh, good friend Michael, who's a therapist out in New York. Uh, you know they, they know more than anything that they're really championing this whole this whole concept. Okay, thank you. And I've got two burning questions I want to ask, and then we'll go to closing remarks here because we have eight minutes left. Um, first question is for you, Dr. Valente. You said that you test patients every six months. Question is: Is that sufficiently frequent to pick up subclinical lymphedema? Um, that's a good question. And I, and I don't know if we a hundred percent know the answer to that. Um, but I think Dr. Gomber Walla talked about it, you know, patients don't want to come that frequently. So we tried to set it up. So that's when they're either seeing the medical oncologist, surgeon or survivorship. So that's when, um, we collect it as just at their appointment. So we try not to give them extra appointments unless they're triggered and they're actually getting treated for lymphedema. But if they're just getting screened, then we just include it as part of their screening follow-up. Okay, thank you. And um, question about billing. So we talked about at the beginning, you guys are testing everybody, right? Even you even said it's easier not to try and select patients because then you have the baseline after they go through treatment, you know which ones then need to be followed up, but you may not know that at the time of diagnosis. So um, 
If not all insurances cover all patients, how can you test everybody? So um, we got that question quite a few times. So maybe each of you could talk quickly about how you handle billing and how you make sure that you test everybody and still handle the billing aspect of it. Um, and uh, Dr. Valente, why don't we start with you? Sure, um, being part of a large academic center, um, the good thing and the bad thing is I, I don't really work with billing too much. Um, so we do, um, you know, bill out in our electronic medical record for the patients that um, are at risk for lymphedema with the cancer diagnosis. Um, how much gets reimbursed and who gets, um, you know, how that it happens, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, exactly how that works. But, you know, that's what we do. And I haven't heard um, issues from our patients. So I, I'm not really good to ask that question too. Well, thank you. Thank you for your, for, for your transparency. You know, Dr. Lawson, you're in private practice at Nashville Breast Center. How do you guys handle it? Well, so I have sort of my two different hats. So one is my, my Ascension St. Thomas hat. Um, and with that, um, again, it's similar to Dr. Valente that the billing was sort of just a black box in the sky. Um, I do remember that we would charge patients a nominal fee. Um, and it, it, we never got a lot of feedback, you know, either way. So it didn't seem to be a huge loss or someone would have certainly alerted us to that. With the, in the private practice world, it's a little bit um, different. And certainly Dr. Whitworth is the expert on this probably of across the board, um, but we charged, um, before we had a good sort of system in place and before we were working real closely with Impedimed to figure out a way to help get um, assistance with some of the billing, we did charge patients if their insurance wasn't going to cover it, just a nominal fee more so because with our therapist in the office, we have to at least sort of break even to cover those costs. Um, and that actually worked very well for a long time. Um, but now that it's being better reimbursed by more carriers, that's gotten a lot easier. And then working, especially with the Impedimed program of if we're getting denials, we now have kind of a form letter that we do. We send the, the form letter, the records, and then we get really some assistance with helping that. And that it's sort of um, the, the thought of if we continue to almost bombard these insurance companies that aren't carrying it and say, oh, well, this group covers it and this group covers it, that hopefully eventually everyone will get on board. But it just takes some time to do that. But I, I think at a minimum, most programs can usually get it to at least a break-even um, reasonable venture for them. Yeah, and for anyone who's curious, you know, um, Dr. Lawson's partner, Dr. Whitworth, did share uh, their practice economics at our November reimbursement webinar. You can find that on the Impedimed Oncology YouTube channel. And um, they are, they're definitely more than breaking even on the coverage that they get at this point. And then they're working with Impedimed's case assistance program to appeal denied claims, and they're not charging patients for denied claims. So um, if you have any questions about that or wanna get involved in our case assistance program, please talk to your local representative or email us at reimbursement at Um, Dr. Gombarawala, you know, we've got two minutes left here. Mm -hmm. um, comments on billing and then just any closing comments on best practices for anyone on the call that is uh, still on the fence about starting one of these programs. Any words of wisdom or advice? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've, of the group, I probably have a, a a large um, experience with, with billing. It's actually led to a halting of our program temporarily because uh, patients were getting denied and our institution has decided that nominal fee to be quite large. So, um, you know, you have to, the way this works, if there's a procedure that you're doing, you have to bill for it. If it gets denied, the patient has to absorb that cost. And then, so it's up to your institution. And if you're private practice, it makes it easy. You can decide how much you want to pursue. It could be $1, it could be you know, $500, but really, even if it was $1, you'll break even because of how, not break even, you probably, you'll continue to, it'll be more economically beneficial to your group because of how, how much Medicare does reimburse for this. So I'll leave it at that, that it's, it's economically sustainable and make sure that you have the correct nominal fee that makes sense for your practice. And even $1 is, is adequate enough. 
in terms of closing arguments, in terms of is now the right time. So I would argue, I would say that now is the perfect time because number one, you have Sozo, which the technology has come so advanced that it's become an easy vital sign that's universally applicable that any um, any person in your office could take this, take this, do this, and it can seamlessly integrate within your um, uh, EMR if it's if that's possible. And even if it's not, Sozo has the capability of they, they, it comes with the cloud. So regardless, we have three different offices. If a patient goes to any office, that Sozo is still tracked across offices. So that's probably a great thing that we didn't actually even get a chance to touch on. Uh, and then lastly, you have all the different aspects of the um, evidence. You have a meta-analysis, you have a upcoming R randomized multi-center randomized control trial. So you got all you have economics in your favor. It's easy to perform, and you have um, uh, the data to support this. Um, so now is a great time, and you need a physician and you need a physical therapist, and then from there you can you know then you need impedimed as a partner. Thank you. Any other last advice, Dr. Valente? Uh, Dr. Gamber Wallace summed it up really good. I echo that. Excellent. Dr. Lawson, any last words of advice for anyone? I, I would echo that uh, as well. And really that now that we have the tools that we can detect lymphedema when it is reversible, I think we're really, it's a disservice to our patients if we're not testing them, if we're not finding out that information and really doing our best to give them the best possible survivorship that we can. Thank you. Well, listen, thank you everybody for joining so much. It's a uh, Real pleasure, and we're you know we're really honored to have the three of you take the time to talk to us and talk to our audience. To those of you um, still on, uh, our next webinar will take place June 9th. It is going to be an Impediment Academy webinar focused on how to use Sozo and take advantage of our new software version four. Software version four is due out in late May. So keep an eye out for that software update, talk to your team, um, look out for emails for us. And you know that new, it will come with a redesign, new features, reference ranges for body composition, a new segmental analysis. Um, so there's a lot coming with that software and we're really excited to roll it out and talk to everybody about it. So again, thank you all, um, Dr. Gombrowala, Dr. Valente, Dr. Lawson, can't thank you guys enough for your time. And, um, goodbye, everyone. I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Joanne.